Very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning, Emmanuel. Good morning, Sarah. So last time I preached, we explored that idea of the paradox of being human, right? Being both made of divine spirits, but also animal instincts. And I use that illustration of the wolf, right? And how this paradox of being human, it has to be informed by the paradox of our faith. So this Sunday, I wanted to dive a little deeper into that paradox of our faith, this idea that death brings life, or said more sharply, something has to die in order for us to live. Did that make you clench up a little bit? (laughs) That's the feeling I'm going for today though, is that I want you to sit with me in my, my theological sandbox and be in this uncomfortable truth together because I really think it is the crux of our salvation. And it's an absurd idea. It's a tall task for any preacher to to try to explain this, this truth, to convince you all that death is actually really good news. So remember that the logic within the divine life of our self-sacrificing God is foolishness. To the ways of the world, right? It flips the logic of the world on its head. Jesus said today that the ruler of the world will be driven out through his death. And the word, Christ made flesh, God's love, will be lifted up and glorified through his death. He also said that grain has to die, it has to decay. So it's transformed into this plant that will nourish many And he also said we must lose our lives, even hate our lives. We must die to ourselves in order to gain everlasting life with God. And God's love, though, is the driving force. It is the fruit of our transformation, which leads to this new life that we call resurrection, which we will celebrate in Easter. But God's love first goes through death to get to resurrection. And it's this pattern that we will follow continually as disciples of Christ. It is a pattern we will practice in our spiritual, physical, and emotional lives, communally and individually. And you come to church each Sunday to kind of get back in rhythm with that pattern. Now, I'll probably fail to convince you all that death is good news because our culture is so afraid of death. We'll do anything to prolong it. We'll even stick needles in our faces so we don't have to see the decay on our faces. We don't like seeing blood either. We want everything sanitized. So every time I post a picture on my social media of a dead animal, Someone will inevitably say they don't appreciate seeing such graphic and gory content. I realize some of you are rural folk and you see that all the time. We don't want though, I think, to see things that make us feel uncomfortable and remind us the bloody reality of what it takes to nourish us. And I think that's partly why our Catholic brothers and sisters keep Jesus on the cross, on the crucifix, and why Protestants or reformers don't. We want to move on from Christ on the cross, okay? We want to not be thinking about that shame and that suffering that Christ experienced and what that evokes in us, that feeling. Instead, we want to focus on the risen Christ. You'll notice our cross over the sanctuary does not have a Jesus on the cross, But we forget that although the risen Christ is this lovely, white, clean, pure image, that the bloody, tortured Christ is just as important 
and just as holy. And this is exactly the Christ we need to fix our eyes upon during the season of Lent. And Jews and pagans of the first century would have understood this. Temple sacrifices were the norm, right? Animals, their blood was spilled and sprinkled around the altar of the Holy of Holies to cleanse the community of their sins. Blood wasn't necessarily a scary or bad thing. It was the center of temple worship. It was the symbol for life, not death. Crosses, excuse me, bones and skulls are symbols of death. Blood, however, is our life source. It is rich and thick with this living material that God has made in us to keep us alive. And in Christ, God's blood is spilled out for the life of the whole world. And new life comes through the transformation of that blood. And that transformation only happens when we encounter the weight of death. That's why they killed animals in the temple and not out in the barn, so that people had to encounter death before they could make, be made clean from their sins. And eating meat was a special occasion. They didn't do it all the time. Meat was more holy, it was more precious, because it cost something to get it. It cost a life. Something had to die in order for us to live. And I think we've lost something by not having to viscerally come in contact with that anymore. And I don't think what's missing is a need for us to feel bad about ourselves as miserable offenders all the time. Although you could, the 1928 prayer book we say on Tuesday says that. But I think what's really missing is the weight of God's glory through encountering Christ's death on the cross. Can you imagine what the disciples and the early you know, Christians and the women and Mother Mary experienced when they saw their Lord tortured on the cross? It's hard to truly encounter those feelings when our representation of Christ's body and blood are nice little neat crackers sanitized, packaged beautifully in this wonderful fine wine we get to drink. There's nothing messy or gory or smelly, nothing to jolt your senses into realizing something very holy is going on over here. Now, I'm not saying we need to go back to animal sacrifices. Don't, don't hear me saying that. I don't think we need that to feel something deep. I'm just saying that we need to be okay with naming death and encountering it in our worship and in our everyday lives. Because without it, I think we're missing out on participating in the full mystery of God's love in our faith. We miss out on the thing that changes us. That transformative power of Christ's Love is in the lifeblood. And we can't experience that unless we encounter the cross. We can't experience resurrection without death first. That is the paradox of our faith. It is total and utter mystery. And my job as a priest isn't to get you to think correct thoughts about this great truth and what it means, because I don't know what it means. We can't fully comprehend God, or I would be God, right? But I do believe to my core that God can be experienced. God can be encountered, and that is our job, is to help you see, to feel, to smell, to taste. And to know in your soul that you are witnessing and experiencing something very, very holy. And that witness should change you. It should return you back to God, your maker. 
You see, Christ made the ultimate sacrifice to bring all people into himself. So we don't have to make blood sacrifices anymore, thank God. We now just simply bring our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving by offering ourselves, our souls, our bodies. We offer ourselves to die a spiritual death at the altar so that Christ's love may be glorified in us and through us. So that we might be a living, breathing example of God's love in the world. So we desire to be transformed, to be resurrected as a new creation in Christ's love. Think about your baptism here or any of the sacraments. That's the point of the sacraments. To encounter God, to experience transformation so we can become more like Christ. Our self-sacrificial Savior. So when we actually face death, we don't have to be afraid. Because we know the rest of the story, right? The disciples didn't know in today's text that death wasn't the end. But we do. We know that death is just simply a signal that new life is on the way. We can have hope in the truth we proclaim that Christ has died, Christ has risen, and Christ will come again. That is why the practice of our faith is so, so important. Practicing death in Christ looks like this. A woman I visited in the hospital before her surgery, when I asked her, what can I pray for you about? About surgery, getting rid of this cancer, I'm thinking she'll want me to pray for getting rid of this cancer. And she said, no, I want you to pray for God's will to be done, not mine. Looks like your best friend who's walked beside you for 20 years who lives five hours away and comes during the middle of the work week, five hours one way, five hours back, to help you pack up and leave an abusive marriage. It's a police officer responding to a domestic abuse call to break up a fight and put their body in between the bullets and the fists of fighting. It's a community committing itself to feeding the poor and clothing the homeless. It's a widow giving her very last dime to the church. Friends, I challenge you to face the cross as we walk towards Holy Week together. Face Christ's sacrifice, not with shame, but with thanksgiving. Because we know the rest of the story. We know that Christ's blood was shed for the life of the whole world. And for us, death to self, death to the ways of this world is just the beginning of life and the loving, liberating logic of Christ, our Savior. So let us come to this table together to eat Christ's flesh and drink Christ's blood and be filled with the weight of his glory. Amen.